Hey, what's happening, everybody? It is Pastor Matt Stokes and Jesse Stokes, what's going on? ministry collaborator of Coastal Christian, and we are on the back porch trying to change up the situation just a little bit. So, hey, it's a morning meditation, and we are going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We th So often I want to come back on a Saturday and talk about what Sunday is going to be like, and Saturday just gets away from us. So I thought maybe we talk today a little bit about about what this passage is going to be about on Sunday morning. And maybe it would also inspire you, it would encourage you to possibly bring somebody with you so that they can come into that same coastal space and receive the same encouragement and strength and an increase in faith and trust in Jesus, right? So Jess, do you want to pray first as we yeah. begin? And then we'll sure. just look a little further into some of these verses we'll be talking about on Sunday morning. All right. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word, Lord, that gives us truth in a world full of deception. Lord, we have the true north compass that leads us back to our heavenly Father. Yes. So I pray, God, that you would enlighten us, um, comfort us, strengthen us, encourage us, empower us, and revive us to follow you. In wow. Jesus' name, amen. That was a lot. That's really good. I hope God does me, all yeah. that today. Yeah. Yes. So boom, boom. Let, let's talk, the place we left off is Paul has written a letter called 2 Corinthians. His first letter was very strong. It was very direct. He wasn't beaten around any bush. There's certainly encouragement in 1 Corinthians. No but he also really um, is very clear on answering certain questions that have to do with Christian life on um, on how to walk worthy and how to live amongst the body and how we should be treating one another. And then 2 Corinthians comes because apparently the church is still in turmoil, maybe even just on a different level. Now there are those that are trying to undermine Paul's work. There were those that were betraying him, saying that he was fickle because he said he was going to visit. But then he didn't visit. He just wrote the letter. And they're like, how much does he really care about you if all he did was write a letter? Mm -hmm. Like when the scholars put it together, they're able to determine from what we know of the book of Acts, what we know from both the Corinthian letters, we can gather where Paul's heart was, yeah. his pathos, as they say, when he was pouring out his heart with this pen and the parchment and writes Second Corinthians. Okay. So when he starts the letter, he starts out with, Yes, you want to read those first five verses? Yeah. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Okay, so there's so much there, right? So let's just consider what's being said. We'll just get past the introduction, and I encourage you to listen to the message from last week to get that, the grace and peace to you, the fact that he mentions Timothy in the introduction. But then he goes into this piece and he says, <clears throat> just get blessing, which is actually the word eulologos, which is you means to lift up like a eulogy, mm -hmm. and logos is words. It's to lift High up words. highest, the highest words we can give uh, to the Lord, right? High words given unto him. So yeah. when we bless someone, we say high words unto you, right? Yeah. Words of virtue and value for who you are. Well, the highest words given unto God, right? Who is in this particular passage called the Father of the the mercies. Father of Mercies and the God of all comfort. God of all comfort. Okay, just in case he didn't nail it down, he's the Father of Mercies oh. and the God of some comfort. No, no. God of oh. all comfort. Right? Who's able to comfort us? Um, and then he says, by that measure, we're able to then take that and comfort others. So, so then t that's what I'm going to pick up on on Sunday to talk about a little bit further because Paul does as he goes into verse 6. Can you read verse 6 for us, Jess? Yeah. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings 
which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. All right, so here's something, and I've read Second Corinthians before, but I've never actually did some serious constructing of the verse and then deconstructing of the verse. So notice what it says in the very beginning. It says, whether we, we, by the way, there's an interesting, if you're writing in your Bible right now, circle the word in verse six in the beginning. It says, whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation. At the end of verse six, it says, whether we be comforted, it's for your consolation. There's this we and this your that's moving throughout the passage because Paul is trying to show his simpatico, if you will, between himself and his team and the Corinthians in their community, right? And he says, so there's two bookends. The first one says, if we be afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation. In other words, it's either to strengthen you or bring you to get saved. Or whether we're comforted, it's for your consolation, it strengthens you, or it brings you to get saved. So no matter whether we're afflicted or comforted, it's going to lead to two things. Your consolation, and that's that word, parakaleo, which can mean some comfort, it can mean courage, it can mean soothing, it can mean strengthening, right? It, it's either, or, it can, or salvation, consolation or salvation. That's going to happen if we're afflicted. And it's going to happen if we're comforted. That's going to have the same result in you. Can you see, Jess, how can somebody experience strength and, and, and salvation when they watch another individual be afflicted or the opposite, be comforted? I mean, I didn't ask you this before now, so I'm kind of yeah. putting you on the spot. Can, yeah. But can you imagine how that could happen? Yeah. Well, it's, um, you know, compassion is built through trial. Like, compassion is almost like a fruit of the Spirit. Love is a fruit of the Spirit, right? And so your love and your faith and your ability to comfort others comes through your own experience. And think about uh, the amount of people that go back into the situations that they've faced that other people are now facing the same trial and they're able to be a voice and be a, a love a loving presence in that. Am I answering your question right? Well, actually, what you just touched on with that last sentence you just said is the middle part between the sandwich. Oh, when okay. he says it's the effectual, in the effectual enduring of the same sufferings, yeah. that's how this happens, yeah. right? So effectual, yeah. right? It's, it's probably, I didn't look up the word in Greek, but I have a guess that it's probably an Aragon. It's the same word where we get the word effective, yeah. or we get the word energy, or we get the word work. So there's a work that's going on, yeah. and that work is causing an endurance, and we're all enduring in different ways. Yeah. And um, that's why it's the same suffering. It doesn't mean that my suffering is like Jesse's suffering. Yeah. I can suffer in one way, and Jesse can suffer another. I might suffer um, from abandonment of my closest friends. Jesse might suffer financially because he can't pay his bills. It's not the same suffering in that sense. Not in the same way. Watch this now. It's in the same result. Because my... Watch this, because we're talking about affliction and comfort. Yeah. My abandonment and Jesse's affliction can have the same result that they both draw us closer to Christ. Yeah. Okay, well how could that possibly draw you closer to Christ? Well, when you see how we are afflicted with abandonment and poverty, and you watch how we're handling that, we're enduring it, we're persevering through it, right? We're facing it and, 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 and absorbing it. It inspires your faith because you can see just how much overwhelming circumstance we're actually able to take when we're in Christ and we're able to endure. That's the word that's used here. It means to bear up under intense amounts of pressure. That can lead to your inspiration and consolation and strengthening. Yeah. On the other hand, the second part of the verse, what? Because you got to look at the verse because it's, it's the, the construct is essential. The second part says, or whether we be comforted. If Jesse's blessed by a check for $408, which is the exact amount that he needs on his truck payment, right? That's going to encourage you now. You're going to find strength and encouragement in that. Yeah. And if I'm surrounded by people that come and support me and strengthen me, and now I'm able to move in certain directions in, in a team in order to um, be able to fulfill a certain ministry or accomplish certain goals, you're going to see my life getting strengthened, and that's going to bring you 
strength or yeah. encouragement or even salvation when you say that's how God works. Yeah, well, think about how many times Hebrews 11 talks about the examples of faith. Right. And so we're encouraged by, you could read through Hebrews 11 by Moses, Abraham, you know, Joseph, um, you know, everyone in there, Abel, um, Enoch, because they're examples of how they've trusted God through trial. So it's like, okay, I can do that too. Right. So we're also a great cloud of witnesses. It's not just the Old Testament saints. It's, yeah. I'm, an, I'm a great cloud of witnesses. Dad's a great cloud. He's a part of the great cloud of witnesses. Other people, I'm yeah. not boasting in self or anything, but just saying that the body of Christ that is running right. running the race or, and trusting God. Or we have the potentiality to be. Yeah, we all And have. so do you, yeah. right? And that's the message that he's saying there. You use the word example. Yeah. We can be an example, watch this. We can be an example in our affliction yeah. and how we handle that in Christ. And we can be an example in our comfort and in our consolation and in our strengthening. And that also can lead people to being inspired yeah. or to be saved. But the opposite is true too. Like the people that have fallen away from God uh, that can also other people have been damaged right. by people that have been examples that have fallen away that they've really looked up to that person right right you know yeah. so you know and that's not our responsibility it's not well your, your responsibility is just to Jesus not to man but you have to realize that people do watch your life yeah your you, faith matters your faith matters and it's Paul, an impact even though you don't see it that's why being an example is so important yeah and that Jesus says, I've left you an example. Yeah. What does he say? He says, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, what? Go. You go. Yeah. Right? So I've done this, but now I'm leaving you the example to follow, to preach the gospel, to make disciples. Yeah. So then in verse 7, he just nails down verse 6 and he says this. Can you read verse 7, Jess? And our hope for you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye also be of the consolation. Okay, that's just a summary of verse 6. He's saying our hope, our concrete confidence, our trust that what God said he's able yeah. to do, it is steadfast. Yeah. I'm going to say it's probably a stay in me. It means to be established. Like the idea of, did you ever see like um, a lifeguard when he hits the stake in the ground with the flag and he kind of goes like this and he really gets it down in there deep and then he blows the whistle and points to the flag like stay on this side. You ever yeah, see that? Have, yeah. Okay, that's this word, you know, a steadfast, right? To, to grab it whole and to that's secure right. it, right? Yeah, yeah. He's saying that's how we feel. Like, look, look, this, watch. Boom, I'm pointing to the Corinthians. Our hope is steadfast knowing. It's his, his, his hope is not steadfast feeling, yeah. right? His hope is steadfast in knowing. And what does he know? He knows that if you've been partakers in the sufferings, you're also going to be partakers in the consolation. Yeah. So both those things are there, and God's going to be able to use both. I'm thinking of, can you think of any other verses that talk about being partakers of suffering and he is also being partakers of encouragement, strength, consolation, hope. I think about um, Romans 8. It says that we are co-heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might also be glorified with him. Right. Did you, so say that again, Jess, because it's mind-blowing that you're thinking of this verse too. Yeah. Go ahead. Romans, Romans 8, 8 says... Somewhere around 16, 17. It says that we've received the spirit of adoption as sons, and if children, then heirs co-heirs with Christ. Yay! Provided, comma, provided that we suffer with him oh. in order that we might also be glorified with him. Yay! Do you see what's happening here? Yeah. It's like, we're, we're, we're co-heirs with him. Yay! And that also means we're going to suffer with him. Oh, that doesn't sound good. But yeah. suffering him with him also means that we're still going to be glorified with him, right? Yeah. I'm also thinking of, um, in Rome, uh, Wait, in uh, 2 Corinthians where it says, wait, is it, no, in Romans 8 where it says it works for us, our sufferings right now. They work for us. They work. There's that word. It's effectually enduring. They work for us a what? Eternal weight of glory. Right, an yeah, eternal second, weight of glory. 2 Corinthians. That's second Corinthians. Oh, then I'm thinking of the one that says they're not worthy to be compared. Our present sufferings aren't worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. I think it's the same thing, right? There's actually two different passages. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'll, you know, we'll post them in here. One is 2 Corinthians 4 going into 5. Um, and then the other one, I believe, is Romans 8, where it says, For I reckon, right, that these present su sufferings aren't worthy to be compared as one. And the other one is the one that says they work for us. 
that uh, they I work. think you're right. Yeah, one is Romans 8. They work for us. So all I'm saying is the, there's, there's more than one passage that's really pressing home the point that somehow um, suffering produces a greater glory, or at least it has the potential to if we stay in what we call a Christocentric mindset, right? If we have a Christ mentality in the midst of it all. Yeah. So that's also should be encouraging as well. Then he jumps tracks. Four, right? Four means with a view to here. I'm chain, here. I wanna. I wanna establish what I'm saying. Four. I don't want you, my brother, to be ignorant of our trouble which has come to us in Asia. All right. So he uses the word brother, Adolfas. He's using something very endearing. So when you hear the word ignorant, don't think he's being like, "Yo, man, you ignorant." He's saying it in a way that just means, I, for you're my brothers and I didn't want you to be unknowing about what happened to us in Asia. Yeah. And by the way, Asia is not like Asia, like Japan and China. Asia in those days was modern day Turkey, which oh. you have been to. I have. Yeah. Right? Amazing, right? So he's saying there's something that happened to us there. Can you read the rest of verse 8 there, Jess? Yeah, yes. uh, let me just read. It says, it came to us in Asia that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired even of life. Okay, so there's three pieces that you get here when he tries to tell you about the trouble in Asia, right? Asia is not as important as the fact that he says trouble. The word trouble actually means that he was pressed. Yes. Flipsis, I think, is the word. So what kind of trouble was he in? Do you have any guess at what kind of trouble he was Probably in? persecution. Okay. That's my guess. And persecution is definitely a part of 2 Corinthians. So no doubt he was, um, there was, there was uh, gossip that was happening about him. That's why he's writing. There was betrayal by people that he trusted. Um, there was an undermining of his authority, right? And there was definitely just persecution for just naming the name of Christ. Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 tells us that there very well may have been physical infirmity he was dealing with as well. Okay. When he's crying out for God yeah. to take this messenger uh, yeah. from Satan, thorn. this thorn in the flesh, yeah. and he says God shows, shows up and tells me that his grace is going to be sufficient. Yeah. So you have a physical possibility. Yeah. You have a relational possibility. Yeah. And then the circumstance possibilities that come out of is it second Corinthians 11 where he lists all the, 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 the all the perils yeah. of ministry it is 11 yeah and you can just say off the top of your head what are some of the things that he says you you have physical you have relational and then what are some of the things in circumstantial the trouble that he might be having we just read yeah a little bit uh, three times I was beaten with rods once I was stoned three times I was shipwrecked a night and day I've been adrift at sea and journeyings often in perils by water and perils of robbers, perils of my countrymen, perils by the heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, and weariness and painfulness in watchings often, and hunger and thirst and fastings often, and cold and nakedness. So just let's take one, okay? <laughs> cold. How about just cold? Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever been chilled to the bone okay. where like, you know, first you're cold, then you're doing this, and then there comes a time where your teeth are chattering, and I don't know, I've been cold, so cold that my whole body had been shaking, right? And I actually couldn't stop it even after I got out of the cold. Paul's saying, like, I lived in that world so that I could take the gospel somewhere. And <laughs> so that And nakedness, right? So, like, he didn't know where he was going to get his next set of clothes. I'm just saying... I don't know if we really understand the circumstantial trouble that he was going through. Maybe we can relate to some of the physical trouble. Some of us have cancer. Some of us are struggling with different chronic illnesses, some terminal diagnoses. There's relational problems that we've all had. Who among us hasn't suffered betrayal, uh, the, the, the forsaking of your closest friends, uh, people that you thought you trusted had turned their backs on you, or even worse than turning your back, like as if isolation wouldn't be enough. How about they come back just to gossip about you, right? Someone's trying to undermine who you are, right? And you're trying to do the best you can to, to be uh, excellent for the Lord. And they're like, he's not that excellent. Let me tell you some things about him or her, right? Like we've all gone through those things. But so this list that Jesse's reading out of 2 Corinthians 11, man, that's physical, relational, circumstantial. That's all wrapped up in trouble right there. Yeah. To the degree, now watch this, to the degree that he says three things. I was pressed out of measure and what, Jess? 
not sure what. Uh, beyond, above strength, your Bible probably says. Are you, are you in Second Corinthians? Second Corinthians. No, I'm in, no, I'm sorry. I'm back in the in the passage one. Eight, oh, okay. One. So much trouble in Asia that we were pressed, pressed out of measure, measure above strength, in so much as we despaired of life. And then look at verse nine. There's actually one more. And we had the sentence of death upon ourselves. Okay, we can actually count that as a fourth one, maybe, and yeah. say. So I don't know where you are today, but have you ever felt like you were pressed out of measure? The word "pressed" there actually has the idea of in medieval times. They, you know, you've heard of the rack. We talked about the rack a few weeks ago. Remember that? Yeah. How people used to rack the word. Well, not only was the the rack, they also had the press where they would put like a panel, a piece of wood on you, and then they would put weights on it. Oh. And then they'd add more weights until it was crushing you to the point that you would confess or you would you know, admit or whatever it was that you needed to do for your, or, or you would just die because of your crime. And that's how they would press you, right? And he says in this piece, we were pressed out of measure. Whatever we could handle, it was beyond that. And that's what he says next. He says, above strength. Okay, so like here's my strength meter. Like here, right? There it is. Uh, this is all I got. And it's saying, guess what? The trouble went like this. Boosh. Right? It went vertical past, beyond, above my strength. Mm. How many of you... Have ever like reached up and you grabbed the chin up bar and then you got seven, eight, nine, and then somewhere around 11, you just eked out 11 and you knew that as soon as your arms went down, you were not coming up for 12. You were beyond strength. You were at that last moment. And sometimes you see in a movie, they show a guy's hand gripping a rope and they show his hand slipping off the rope, right? So what? It's just a hand on a picture slipping off a rope. But we all look at it and we go, ooh, ooh, why? Because we all know the feeling, yeah. right? Not just of a hand slipping off a rope, but that moment of desperation in life where whatever it was that we were holding on to is slipping. So when we're in that movie, we're gripped by that moment because it means so much to know that when we're out of strength. And then he says, we despaired of life itself. When he thought about life, when he thought about living, it was, a, it was a despairing thought. There was disparity that was attached to the thought of yeah. living. So much that in verse 9, what's that first line? So we had a sentence of death upon ourselves. It's like the gavel came down in the courtroom and yeah. it was like, you shall be executed. That's how he was feeling, right? Another, it was in ourselves is what it was. It wasn't that it was a literal sentence of death from a judge. The metaphor here is that yeah. he was feeling like the condemnation of death was upon us. Now, we'll close up our time by talking about here's where, here's where the cherry gets put on top, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's it say after that, the sentence of death? That, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. Okay, so the whole reason that that's happening, the whole reason that this is happening, okay, it's a mess, it's ugly, physical, relational, circumstantial, pressed beyond measure, above strength, despairing of life, sentence of death, all that happens, that, in fact, if you said, what's the key word in this passage, is it, you know, despair, is it trouble, a Trust. sentence of death, it's its the word that. No. That. This is all happening for a purpose. Yeah. Whose purpose? My purpose? I certainly don't want this. No. Satan's purpose? No, he would want me to give in to all of that. Yeah. The world's purpose? No, the world is the one that's betraying, crucifying, denying, persecuting, right? No, that, this is God's purpose. That we should do two things. One's a negative. What's the first thing we should do? We should trust in God. Right. Well, the first one's a negative. We should not trust in ourselves. Ourselves. Right. We should right? not trust in ourselves, right. but in God. But in God. So there's two. Th the reason that it happened, that it happened, that here's the that. You ready? That that is is there for a purpose. Yeah. And the purpose is twofold. One, that we not do something that's trust in ourselves, and that we do something, and that is trust in God. By the way. Who's he got? Who, the God who does what? Raises the dead. The God who raises the dead. Okay. Yeah. So he feels like he's pressed out of measure, above strength, despairing of life. We got that sentence of death. So there's only one person I can hope in right here. And it's not the one who's going to give me cash. It's not the one who's going to come alongside me and go, you can do it. Right. I need something better than that right now. Yeah. I need the God who raises the dead That's right. because I think I'm going to die. Yeah. So listen, you might, listen, I, 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 I understand that I'm speaking beyond my measure when I say this, but you might have cancer.
okay? Um, you might have a terminal illness, okay? You might just be aging out in life. And the only answer is death, okay? Death is coming. And there's only one person to trust in when you know you're going to die. And that is the God who raises the dead. There is no other hope other than the God who raises the dead. It's the ultimate hope because the ultimate end is death. Therefore, the ultimate hope would be to trust in, to believe in, to lean on, to rely upon a God who raises the dead. And then in verse 10, we'll wrap it up right here. What's he say in verse 10, Jess? Verse 10 says, Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver and whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Okay, so in this one verse, you have past, present, and future. Yeah. We trust in the God who raises the dead. Oh, by the way, he did deliver us from so great a death, and he is delivering us from so great a death, and we trust that he will yet deliver us in, in, from, from whatever trial or affliction until the day he takes us home. So, what's the whole point? The point is, don't trust in yourself. Trust in God who raises the dead right. and who, who delivers in every dimension. What? Right. Dimension? Yeah. Past, present, future, God is the deliverer in all of those circumstances. So what I want to do is I want to do... God brings... Here's the summary. God brings terrible things into our lives. Mm -hmm. But the point of that is to utterly destroy trust in self right. and cause us to ultimately rely on God. I'm thinking right. about that quote, you know, about I didn't know that God was all I need until, yeah. you know what it is? All I have. Until God was all I had. Right. Somebody, one Christian said, I didn't know that, that I think it was Jesus was the, I didn't know that Jesus was all I needed until Jesus was all that I had. And God in his love and sovereignty and in his mysterious wisdom may actually just eradicate from our lives every possible area in which we can trust he will uproot them like weeds so that the beauty of what he wants to grow is going to be able to take its full strength right. there's a landscaping analogy for you to start your day yeah all right there you go. so i hope that helps that's what sunday morning's going to be about maybe we'll put some more illustration in there to to drive it home but uh the next passage what does 11 say just for kicks 11 says yet also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed on us by the means of many persons thanks may be given by many on our behalf all right so if i just had to wrap up that whole one verse i would yeah. say oh by the way if you're saying matt i'm listening to this you would, okay so how how's this happen one way i know it happens is is as we pray for each other because he's saying here, and all this is happening because I know that you're praying for me. That's right. And that you're praying for each other. And that what this is going to result in is this effectual praise that's going to be lifted up to God as we all rejoice yeah. and spiritually high-five each other and bless the Lord, the God of all comfort, the Father of mercies, for the way that he showed up and made his word real in our lives. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Got anything else you want to share before we close it out? Um, I was just thinking that suffering in our lives produces compassion for others. That's just really stuck on my mind. And I thought about how Jesus is our high priest who's able to have sympathy in every situation for us because he went through every temptation yeah. that we went through. Yeah. So when we go through temptations, tests, hardships, yeah, um, we can now, like Christ, be that high priest. We're not the high priest, but we're a royal priesthood. Right. So we, what a priest is, is someone that mediates between God and man. And so we mediate between God and man. I mean, there's one mediator, Christ, but we bring people to Christ. So we can step into hardships when we go through hardship ourselves. We have right. like a, a voice to speak into something. Right. Because I've been there before. At least we have the potential to. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we don't let our suffering actually yeah. have produced in us James chapter 1. We don't let it produce that good, perfect work that it can do to bring us to maturity yeah. and increase our faith. But it has the potential to That's right. if we let it. Okay, well, how do I let it? Well, first, you've got to saturate yourself in prayer. 
and pray for others so that you become other centered and not and not and not self centered. The other is is to look into God's word at passages like this and see how great men and women of God have overcome adversity. That's right. Right. So there's different ways in which we can say, okay, so how do we enact this in our lives? Another way is we can look back on the faithfulness of God, just like Paul did, and he said, He has delivered me. Yeah. He is delivering me now, and I trust that He will continue to deliver me and everyone else that puts their faith and trust in Him. That's right. And and the hope is is that we see it on this side of heaven. But he's saying, even if I didn't, I'm still going to trust in the God that raises the dead. Reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's like, well, God's going to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we are still not going to compromise. So I hope that blesses you guys. And Jess, you want to pray us out? Yeah, yeah, let's Uh, let's pray. Father, um, we thank you, Lord, that you raise us from the dead, that death is just the doorway into everlasting life. And if we join you in your suffering, then we'll join you when you rise. For you receive the glory and the honor and the praise, God. I pray for your people that you would strengthen them through any trial they're facing. That they would count it as joy because you're producing in them patience. Mm. Let that patience have its perfect work so that they might be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, as we go, we just want to say thank you so much for joining us last week when we just met at our new space, 2577 Tilton Road in EHT. It was like, it's a day that I won't forget for the rest of my life. And I just want to thank everyone, Jesse, our whole family, thanks you for your support for our family, for your love for our family, for your care for Coastal Christian. Um, And God has really... He's delivered us. He is delivering us. And we trust that he will continue to deliver us. So, and bless us as we continue to proclaim the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the foundation that we have in the truth of the word of God, right? Making disciples, reaching lost people. We'd love to see you there and be a part of what God is doing with us at Coastal. We meet at 930 and that address again is 2577 Tilton Road. All right. So we definitely look forward to seeing you there. There.